picture this. You are the most important person in the world, the most popular person. Everywhere you go, people recognize you and cater to your needs. So you walk into a random restaurant and the host welcomes you by name. She takes you to the best table and the waiter is there waiting for you already with your favorite glass of wine. While you sit, you know, the, the waiter says, the chef has already started preparing your favorite meal cooked in perfection, exactly the way you want it. And when you think it doesn't get any better, the lights and music, the atmosphere adjust just to your perfection. It's perfect, it's magical. Sounds good, right? So the problem is that very few people get to experience and receive this specialized service. There's very, very few people. But everyone deserves to be special. Can we make billions of people on Earth feel appreciated and respected everywhere they go? And can we do this in an affordable and sustainable manner? So think about the last time you went on social media application or an online service. What, when we go to the same service, what you and I see is very different. What we experience is different. Everything online is tailored to each and every user for billions of people. But doing the same thing in the physical world has a number of challenges that we must overcome. It's much, much more difficult. And we spend most of our lives offline, not online. So there are three things that we need to accomplish in order to be able to uh, bring to life this vision. The first one, we need to be able to identify people quickly, accurately, and continuously. Online, it's easy. We have, you know, the device ID, we have the user account, and so forth. In the physical world, this is much more difficult because the only thing that we have is credit cards, keys, and they don't meet the necessary requirements. And people, you know, we, we're like food. We are diverse, we're unique, but at the same time, we want to belong to, to a group that shares the same values. So a, getting an idea about the demographics of people in the physical world is hard because when you have a crowd of people, you cannot stop everyone and ask them what are their preferences. And like humans, you know, we smile and we cry and we laugh and we have all of these ranges of emotions. And online, the way we are keeping track of the engagement is we count the number of clicks, how long you spend on the content, likes, hearts, and so forth. Uh, but when it comes to real life, you know, in the physical world, the only thing we can do is service. And these have many limitations. Think about the last time you took a flight and you went somewhere and then you got an email from your provider asking you to read your experience. Or when you call for customer support and then they tell you, stay on the line to read your experience. How many of you do? Almost nobody. It's usually just the angry people that they want to complain about something. <laughs> so the, the, the service, they have very limited input that they, they can give us. So there is one solution which, is, which can address all of these problems, and it's computer vision. So we can recognize a person from a database of hundreds of thousands of faces in milliseconds. And the accuracy of facial, facial recognition in the last two years especially, it has grown exponentially. State-of-the-art methods work equally well across all demographics. Methods, there are other models that can uh, get an idea, they can determine demographics within the blink of the eye. And sentiment models can analyze facial microexpressions, and we can tell what is the type, duration, and intensity of each of the feelings we are feeling. And what this let us, lets us do, we can personalize the experience of the users throughout their entire journey. What we can do for one face, we can do for many. So if I had this technology right now pointing at the audience, I could tell if you like the presentation and the talk, or maybe not so much. Or to put it differently, I could tell which groups of people are the most and least engaged and at which, which points. So this is very, very cool and useful information we can start you know, recording. And again, this is where we stand today. With a single camera, we can detect and analyze thousands of faces. The power is really, really mind-blowing. It has grown very, very quickly. And this is only to grow even faster. There's a lot of power that comes with facial recognition. It completely changes what we know. And when we talk about facial recognition, there's one of two reactions that people you know, give us. They say, 
wow, that's cool, or wow, that's scary. It's one of the two, usually. <laughs> hey. And both of them are valid. Both of them are valid. So let's talk about the first group. And you know, facial recognition is powerful, and with great power comes great responsibility. We should never underestimate the importance of security and privacy. On the other hand, you know, facial recognition is like a sharp knife. Somebody can use it with the worst intentions, or they can use it to cook a delicious meal for their family. There's a lot of power and a lot of possibilities that come with the technology, and we cannot close our eyes and neglect them. So what do we do? Well, fear usually stems from two things. The first one is that people, they don't understand how it works, and they feel a lack of control over how it affects them. So educating ourselves will help us shift our minds of being afraid and have a fight or flight response to being concerned, which is a better place to be if we want to make important decisions. The, the second thing that comes with these technologies, you know, the, the second group, is that they usually say, you know, facial recognition is very powerful, we must go all in. And they say we just, you know, especially the tech community a lot of the times, we just develop a tool, it is not our responsibility how it's been used. And no, this is not the case, because when you're building a very, very powerful technology, there are safeguards you can build in within this existing tool to make it safer and respect people's privacy. So let's talk a little bit about how we can harness the power of facial recognition so that we can disseminate it safely. The first thing has to do with consent. We should ask for consent before storing any data. A lot of the services, even without face recognition, they assume consent the default option, and the user, after they sign up for the service, then they have to know and assume that this was the case, go to the settings, find the opt-out button, and a lot of the time, by then, it's already too late because all of the data has been recorded. In addition to asking consent in advance, the consent must be very explicit about the way the data is going to be used and how long we're going to retain it. Which brings us to the next point, which has to do with the right of its user to be forgotten. If you give consent and you enroll your data, but for any reason you change your mind, you should be able to delete your information just as easily, both from the servers, backups, everywhere. It has to happen with a click of a button at any time. And it is you know, surprising that even in our days, sometimes it's very, very hard to delete your account. And even if you do, it's not even clear if all of your data has been erased as well. The next safeguard has to do about the software architecture, the way we're building our services, especially when it comes to sensitive technologies such as facial analysis and facial recognition. So what you can do there about implementing a smart you know, software architecture, you can implement privacy by design. This essentially means you can break down the information from each user, user to multiple pieces and only use and retain the minimum information you need. A lot of services, again, they are collecting everything they can for a user, and the reality is they could offer the same quality of services even if they retained much, much less information. So by breaking it into pieces and only retaining the necessary information increases security because even if a service gets compromised, your information, nobody gets a full picture. So facial recognition is already everywhere. It's globally all over the world. Everybody's using it in this room. Whether you have an album of photos on your phone and you want to sort it automatically based on faces, whether you unlock it with your face, whether you unlock your laptop, when you go on the fast lane or on airports, when you want to verify your identity, you take a picture of your ID and then a selfie, all of these ways, they're applications of facial recognition. And this is just the tip of this iceberg. As long as the <laughs> earth is spinning, uh, adoption is going to grow and it's go going to grow very, very quickly. And this is going to transform the way we're living. It will take personalization, which was constrained to a very small group of people, and it's going to expand it and make it available to everybody. And this presents an opportunity for reshaping the way we live our lives. And this is the, the imagination and things we can do. It's you know so many things. Think, for example, uh, tailored education and maximizing how fast and efficiently you're learning. Going to the doctor's office and receiving instant personalized care instead of having to wait long times and giving all the information again and again and again and again, assessing your well-being live just by looking at you. There are even more applications which have, which have to do with public safety, 
in you know, sporting events, conferences, exhibitions, and so forth. Everywhere we go, we can maximize both convenience and security while respecting people's privacy. And this is the last point that I want to make is that uh, we must educate ourselves because this is happening, whether or not we like it, this is going to happen, this is expanding, and we have a chance of doing this the right way. This is a unique opportunity of implementing all of these technologies in the right way to maximize the potential and mitigate all of the risks. We must educate ourselves, push the private sector to put the right safeguards in place, and urge our elected officials to place regulations in place, to put regulations in place that on one hand protect the end user data, the end user privacy, but at the same time they don't hold back progress. And this is a discussion that we must have and we must have it today because the future is here, now. Thank you. <laughs>